Thank you for listening to this recording of Family Bible Church's Sunday morning message. We pray that God will use this word to bless and encourage you. All right. Uh, thank you, Chuck, for reading that. I have... Um, so as I'm speaking, if I forget to keep talking loud on the back row, raise your hand if you can't hear me, because I'm, as I'm teaching, I'm probably going to forget and lapse into normal voice. Um, so I want to start by going over a few initial observations from the text. Uh, first is context. And if you look back into Luke chapter 9, you see some important context for what's going on here at the start of Luke 10. First, going back over to the transfiguration in Luke 9, 31, where it says, appearing in glory, uh, it's talking about Elijah and Moses who are talking to him. It says they were speaking of his, in New King James, I think you have decease. So you're thinking of his death. The actual Greek word there, if I anglicize it, is exodus, spelled like exodus. So it also has the meaning in the Greek of departing, going out. So keep that in mind. Then you go over to um, verse 51. It came about when the days were approaching for his, in New King James, you have taking up. This word can also mean ascending. So you have the possibility in these two verses that Moses and Elijah are talking to Jesus about his ascension. They're actually looking past his death on the cross. I'm not saying that's definitely it. I'm just letting you know it could mean that when you take the pair of verses. It could mean his crucifixion. But the context is there's this looking towards the end of his public ministry where he's going to be crucified, rise from the dead, and then ascend to heaven. Now, if you look at the rest of 51, it says he resolutely set his face to go to Jerusalem. And from Luke 9, 51 through to Luke 19, verse 27, this trip to Jerusalem is playing out. Now, you may not ever realize that when you just read through Luke. Luke has 24 chapters. Almost 10 chapters of the 24 are in the last few months of Jesus' public ministry as he's on the way the last time from Galilee down to Jerusalem. Now, when you do like a harmony of the Gospels, if you go over and look where he raises Lazarus from the dead because of all the publicity that's going on, he goes a little bit out and then comes back again, but he doesn't go all the way back to Galilee. So we've got 10 chapters out of 24 from Luke that are covering what's happening in this trip from Galilee to Jerusalem. Now that trip, you can do in three to six days. Jesus is apparently taking a meandering course down. He sends these followers of his out in pairs to go to all the different cities and places where he's planning to come. That's in chapter 10, verse 1. So he's not like booking it. To Jerusalem but he's going with determination this is where I'm going I'm stopping in a bunch of different cities and towns along the way he's probably spending only a night or two in each one and some of them he might go through speak a little bit and move on to the next one before it gets to be night so that's what's going on and that's the context and Luke gives us in these 10 chapters while this trip is taking place a lot of parables and teachings that we don't have anywhere else in the other Gospels. So it's really rich, this focus on this trip to Jerusalem. Okay, the other next thing I need to deal with is, is it 70 or is it 72? If you have the ESV, it says 72. If you're in New King James, it says 70. Depending on if you, if you sample English translations, you're going to see both. And what's going on here is in the, the Greek manuscripts, they're roughly evenly divided between 70 versus 72. And the difference is an extra word, D-U-O, when we transliterate it, duo, which would be the two. And a bunch of manuscripts don't have that, that word, and a bunch of manuscripts do have that word. I'm, so they're kind of evenly split. And that's why you see some English translations going with 70, some going with 72. 
Um, I'm going to go with 70, and the tiebreakers for me are number one, New King James, which is what I think most of you use, is 70. And the other thing is that the Greek manuscripts, the oldest one that we have goes back, they, they believe it's dated to between 175 to 225 AD. So that latter part would be early third century. It's the earliest of the manuscripts of Luke, and it says 70. So I think the ones like New King James, uh, the older New American Standards, the 77 and 95 version, I think that's what tipped the scale for them, but they go with 70. So I'm gonna say 70 the rest of the way. Um, it could have been 72. But that means there's at least 35 cities that he's planning to go to. And they may have gone, the, the pairs might have gone to more than one city, so it could be more than that. Uh, the next thing on the pairs, Jesus is following here an example that he's already done with the 12 disciples. By the way, when this says 70 others, these are also disciples of his, but they're not the 12 apostles, okay? And in fact, in, uh, Bob has talked about the Greek word that's used here, but in, uh, in verse one, and when it says the Lord appointed 70 others, that's the Greek word that means others of a different kind. Uh, Bob has talked about that earlier in Luke where it made a difference in, how, in meaning. And he also has talked about it in 1 Corinthians um, 12 where you have the, the three different categories of spiritual gifts. So others of a different kind means the 12, are not, the 12 apostles are not part of this 70 that gets sent out. These are 70 others. He has more disciples following him than just the 12, but the 12 are the inner circle and are staying with him uh, in everything that he's doing. Okay, so um, brief mention about comparing this with Matthew 10. You, you may have noticed if you've been reading in Matthew lately, when he sends the 12 disciples out, the apostles, he says a lot of things that are similar. I'm not gonna take time to do comparison and contrast, but it's clear from Matthew, Mark, and Luke's account, Luke's account of sending the 12 apostles out is, is the beginning of Luke 9. Sending out the 12 apostles in pairs, so six pairs, that happens before the feeding of the 5,000 in all three gospels. It happens before the transfiguration in all three gospels. And then you get to this. So this is a different occasion. We don't know how much time has passed between the two but he sent the 12 apostles out in pairs for some time and they did ministry. And Matthew 10, you get the fullest set of, of instructions that he gives them. And then here he's sending these other 70 out and he's giving them overlapping instruction. There is more detail about the cost of discipleship in the Matthew 10 account that he doesn't give here. And there's also a more detail in regard to their actual mission. In this one, when you get down to verse, um, verse 9, he says they're supposed to be healing the sick and telling everyone that the kingdom of God has come near to you. And by the way, you'll note, he not only says do that if they receive you, but in the shaking of dust off your feet that comes a few more verses later, they're also telling those people the kingdom of God has come near you. In the Matthew 10 account, when the disciples are going out, they're saying the kingdom of, of, of God is coming. So it's almost like, I have a feeling, this is conjecture on my part, but we know Jesus has done ministry in various parts of the land of Israel. Some of these cities are probably ones he's already been in. Many of these people have heard him preach. They followed him, gone to he, in, the, in the crowds and multitudes. And so now it's a past tense. The kingdom of God has come near you because they've heard much of his ministry. This is now at the end, and this is like his last trip through your town on his way to the cross. All right, now verse two says, Jesus was saying to them, the harvest is plentiful or the harvest is great, but the laborers are few. Therefore beseech the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. I wanna point out to you just a couple things about this because this first instruction tees up everything that he's telling the 70 as they go out. So number one, who does the harvest belong to? It belongs to the Lord. It's his harvest. And because it's his harvest, he's got the responsibility to bring it in. It belongs to him. 
but the laborers are few and the harvest is great. Jesus has been ministering two and a half years. There's a lot of people who have heard him, a lot of Israelites who are looking for the Messiah, whether they've come to believe he's the one or not. And the harvest is great before them as they're going from Galilee, taking their time on their way to Jerusalem. And so he says to these disciples of his, pray or beseech, it's like beg the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest fields. And it turns out, ironically, those who are praying, he's telling to pray it, are the first ones to go as laborers. So as a takeaway here, this can be a dangerous prayer, but you're told to pray it if you're a follower of Christ. Why would I not pray it? Well, if I don't really care what the Lord of the harvest cares about, then I might not pray it. So I challenge you as a specific application from Scripture here. This is, we're not good at drawing applications from Scripture, frankly. I don't think so. Where they're measurable and you can a week later say, yeah, I did it or I didn't do it. And where it's changing something in your life. Here's one Jesus just tees up for all of us. Pray that the Lord of the harvest would send out laborers into his harvest. You could pray that every day. It's an easy, quick prayer to pray. And you'd be, you would be definitely in line with obeying what Jesus said. Um, so, the harvest is great and plentiful. It's the Lord's harvest. There's not enough laborers. Pray that he'll send out more. And then to these 70, he now sends them. And the rest of the passage that Chuck read, well, down through verse 16, are the instructions that he's given them. Now, I want to just draw three observations about laborers from this passage. I'm kind of breaking the passage into the remaining verses all the way through 24 into thirds, and I'm drawing out some observations about laborers. So I want to give you three. The first one is that laborers learn to depend on God. Now, in your testimonies, a number of the testimonies had to do about depending on God. So you know some of this already as his children, okay? But I want to point out that you can be a child of God where you profess faith in Christ. His blood has, forgiven you, has brought you forgiveness of sin through your faith, and he's adopted you as his son or daughter. You're his child now. In the Bible, that's called his child. It's called a convert. But there's different categories in Scripture of people who are all his children who have been saved. There are converts who don't necessarily become disciples. In John 8, you can read about such people. There's a bunch of Jews who have believed in him. And when you get to John 8, 31, Jesus says, and Scripture says, to the Jews who had believed in him, if you abide in my word, then you are truly disciples of mine. If you read much further in there, you find out that they turn on him. They get upset about what he says to them. And there's this really tense back and forth through the rest of John 8. I'll leave that for you to go read on your own. But converts don't necessarily become disciples. Disciple means a follower, someone who's following Jesus. In John 6, in the latter half of it, you can read about disciples who are following Jesus and when the teaching gets hard to understand and they have trouble figuring out how can this be, a bunch of them leave them. They quit following. So you can be a convert who's become a disciple and yet end up leaving him, turning away. And the point that I'm getting to is just because you're a convert or even if you're a follower of Christ, a disciple, doesn't mean that you're a laborer in the harvest. But it does mean you're a candidate. If you're a convert, he wants you to be a follower so you can grow in Christ and learn. And if you're a follower, he wants you to become one who labors. I'll come back a little bit more to that later. But my point here is that laborers learn to depend on God. And when you look at what Jesus is telling them in verses 3 through 6 or so, or 7, 
He's basically giving them instructions that force them to depend on God. They're going out as lambs among wolves. So if you think of a lamb, it's not, you know, it's baby sheep. And we think of them frolicking in a field, you know, and they're careless and carefree. A wolf is cunning. They're highly intelligent. And it's looking for its next meal, okay? So they're, they're, they're going to have to depend on God for protection. He's telling them not to take a purse or a money bag. So number one, they're not going to have any more money than what they maybe can hold in their hand or if they got pockets. I don't think they had pockets for their kind of clothes back then. They're not taking much money with them. And certainly if anybody tries to give them money, they don't have anywhere to put it. Okay, so they're not prepared to receive offerings and store up money to pay for the next few weeks worth of food. They're not taking extra food. They're not taking, you, you can, so carry no purse, no bag, no shoes, depending on how you take it, it's either don't carry an extra, extra pair of shoes or maybe it's not take shoes at all. Now I'm gonna go with they're wearing shoes and it's not take extra shoes. The carrying no knapsack, I think both uh, in, in, ES, New King James and ESV says knapsack. Think of a backpack, you know, like uh, teens have in, uh, or college students have at college, a book bag, that type of thing. They're not to carry that because you need that if you're going to carry extra stuff, extra change of clothes, anything like that. So Jesus is causing them to have to depend on God. When they get to a town for their food and shelter, they got to find a man of peace, Scripture says. Someone who receives them, and they stay with that person till they leave that town. If they don't find such a person, they may be spending a night or two out, outdoors. They may go without a meal or two, okay? If you think about what he, if you put yourself in their shoes, Jesus is forcing them to depend on God for the things that they're going to need. And anything that they receive is going to be something they have to use immediately. If someone gives them a pair of shoes, they'll kick off the old ones, I guess, put on the new ones. If someone gives them food, they're going to eat it immediately. If someone gives them shelter, they're taking advantage of it for that night. They're, everything that's given to them is for immediate use. There's no saving up. Now, there's other scriptures in, there's other places in Scripture that tell us that saving and planning ahead are wise things. So don't take this passage to mean that you shouldn't prepare for things, okay? But it is, I think, a clear and compelling fact here that for these people Jesus is sending out, he's forcing them to depend on God. And by the way, this is almost in fulfillment of what he teaches in the chapter 7 of Matthew, the latter part of the Sermon on the Mount. That has been earlier in his ministry, and there's evidence from Luke's version of a similar talk but in a different place he said these things more than once okay he, he, he taught things that we read in scripture more than once as he went from village to village city to city the disciples are are hearing it over and over okay and in in chapter 7 chapter I got wrong I got it wrong chapter 6 of Matthew in the middle of the Sermon on the Mount he tells them that where your treasure is there will your heart be also and he's warning them against letting their heart be tied to treasure that will rust and decay that can be stolen. Tells them to seek treasure in heaven. And then when you get into the latter part of Matthew 6, he's speaking specifically about their daily needs of food and clothing. And I'm turning to that real quick so I can just read you uh, the ending of that. Matthew 6, verse 30 to 33 says, If God so arrays the grass of the field, which is alive today and tomorrow is thrown into the furnace, will he not much more do so for you, O men of little faith? Do not be anxious then, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or with what shall we clothe ourselves? Doesn't that sound like the same things over in Luke 10 that he's telling them not to carry extra of? 32. For all these things the Gentiles, now in the context that means the non-believers, okay? All these things the non-believers eagerly seek, for your heavenly Father knows that you need all these things. But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added to you. That's what Jesus has taught a year or two earlier in his ministry, and I believe he's probably reset it a number of times. 
when we get to Luke 10 and he sends out the 70, he's giving them practical, immediate application of what he's taught them. All right? So, number one is that laborers learn to depend on God. By the way, in your life, this may mean depending on God for food and clothing and shelter. And because of a big storm and power outage, some of you have maybe have experienced having to depend on God for something. Several of your testimonies were along that line. But depending on God is more than just food and clothing and shelter. In the message, in the message notes, I have some, some um, cross-references to other things. But just to give you a few examples, if somebody pushes your buttons or triggers you, that usually means you have something from your past that causes you to react in some sort of way. And we tend to justify that way and blame the other person for making me get angry or whatever. Well, Jesus doesn't let you off with that. I don't have time to chase the verses, but in Matthew 12 and in Matthew 15, he makes clear that every sin comes from the heart. When someone pushes your buttons, when someone triggers you, that's just causing sin that was already there to be revealed coming out of your heart. That doesn't mean that they didn't sin in pushing your buttons and triggering you, but you don't get off with Christ by blaming the other person. So you're going to need to depend on God in the moment when someone pushes your buttons or you feel triggered to depend on God to respond in kindness, to respond in love, to be patient, to give grace to someone. You got to depend on God. You can't do that on yourself. You need to depend on God to live the Christian life, to live in a Christ-like way. Galatians 2.20 is a verse right up this alley. Paul says, I have been crucified with Christ, and it's no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, he's still alive in the flesh, he hasn't died in the, in the body, but he's been connected to Christ in Christ's death on the cross. That's what he's talking about. He says, in the life that I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and delivered himself up for me. Christ dwells in you if you are his child, if you are a believer in him. And he wants to live through you. John 15 is another example of that. The, vine, the branches need to be attached to the vine. That's all about the life of Christ flowing through you. Okay, so number one, laborers learn to depend on God. Laborers don't know this by default. Laborers have to learn to depend on God. So if you're thinking, I'm not good at this, that's okay, you can learn. That's what Jesus wants, is for you to learn to depend on him, to live in a Christ-like way amongst people that irritate you and frustrate you. Welcome to the fallen world. You need Christ to help you respond in kindness and patience and love and grace to other people. Okay, number two, laborers represent the Lord who sends them. So in verse 16, chapter 10, verse 16, this captures it in a nutshell. The one who listens to you listens to me, and the one who rejects you rejects me, and he who rejects me rejects the one who sent me. Oh, thank you. So in that verse, he's giving the principle. When, when the Lord sends you out as a representative of his, by the way, if you're using it in the sun, there is shade over here. If anybody wants to move, you're welcome to. So when the Lord sends you out as his representative, he takes very seriously, more so than I think we tend to think, on how others receive or reject you because he's taking it personally. If you receive or reject the representative of the Lord, you're receiving or rejecting the Lord. Now this actually starts in the Godhead and I want to give you one quick reference. I don't think, I gave you a few references on the notes, but I don't think this one is there. John 5 verse 19 to 23 says this, Jesus therefore answered and was saying to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, the Son can do nothing of himself unless it is something he sees the Father doing. For whatever the Father does, these things the Son also does in like manner. General principle for Jesus' ministry. He's doing the things the Father has shown him. 
He's not coming and just doing his own thing. Verse 20, for the father loves the son and shows him all things that he himself is doing and greater works than these will he show him that you may marvel. Now he's gonna give us a couple examples. Verse 21, for just as the father raises the dead and gives them life, even so the son also gives life to whom he wishes. 22, for not even the father judges anyone, but he has given all judgment to the son. Resurrection and judgment have been given to the son. When Revelation 20 talks about the great white throne judgment, I think that's standing before Christ because the father has given resurrection and judgment to the son. Now look at what he gets to in John 5 verse 23. He says, in order that all may honor the son, even as they honor the father. He who does not honor the son does not honor the father who sent him. Right there we have between the father and the son, the same principle. If you reject the son, you're rejecting the father. If you dishonor the son, you're dishonoring the father. If you receive or honor the son, you're receiving and honoring the father. That's what he's saying in Luke 10 verse 16, but now he... He's extending it to the laborers that he's sending out. Okay. The one other thing I'm, I need to move on, but as a representative of his, it's important that we faithfully represent the message. Now this passage, we only had a little bit about the message, and that was over in verse 5, no, verse, uh, verse 9, heal the sick, Tell everybody the kingdom of God is coming near. But as a representative, we need to be a faithful representative. I'm not going to go into the verses about that. That's outside of this passage. But the key thing to remember is, number one, laborers need to learn to depend on God. And number two, laborers represent the Lord who sends them. And it matters to God. That's why verse 12 through 15, he's talking about these towns that are in bad shape because they've rejected the Son. Tyre and Sidon and Sodom are all going to be better off than the, than the current towns in Galilee that he names because they've rejected the Son. And his whole point by the time he gets to 16 is this applies to people that reject you as you go out representing Christ. All right, last one. Number three, laborers experience the Lord's joy. Now this is just so cool to me. Verse 17 says, The 70 returned with joy saying, Lord, even the demons are subject to us in your name. Now note, Jesus hadn't t given them instructions about demons, according to Luke. But if you go read the Matthew account, when he's sending out the 12 apostles, he had told them um, to heal the sick, raise the dead, uh, cleanse the lepers, and cast out demons. When they come back here and say, even the demons are subject to us in our name, that's implying every other one work of a miracle that we could have done has been happening. This one about demons is the one most surprising. That's kind of what it means. Even the demons are subject to us in your name. They are filled with joy. And here's the general principle I want you to remember. When you, when you see God at work, you experience joy. Why? Because you belong to him and your heart's been changed. You care about what God cares about. And so what comes of that is when you see God at work, you experience joy. You have experienced this, I'm almost certain, at various times in your life, whether it's seeing God work in your own life, seeing him work in someone else's life, an answer to prayer for someone else. That can give you great joy when you find out the answer. We right now have a group of laborers who have been sent out almost in the same spirit of Luke 10. They're down in Argentina. And the more you care about what's on God's heart, the more you're probably going to be filled with joy when you hear stories from them of how God worked. Okay? So when you see God work, it gives you joy. Now, Jesus actually adjusts their thinking a little bit. In verse 18 through 20, he says, Behold, I have given you authority to tread upon serpents and scorpions over all the power of the enemy, and nothing shall injure you. Nevertheless, do not rejoice in this, that the spirits are subject to you, but rejoice that your names are recorded in heaven. 
what Jesus has come to earth about more than anything is that people would know the Father and know the Son. And in, I'm not going to take time to read it all, but in 21 to 24, when he rejoices, he says that. He's rejoicing in a prayer to God, and he says that, that God has seen fit that babes, not the wise and intelligent, but babes, would know the Father and know the Son. In John 17, Jesus, in his, his high priestly prayer, he defines what eternal life is, and he says it's to know you, the Father, and to know the Son whom you sent. That's the biggest thing to rejoice in, is that you have a relationship with God. By extension, as you see others come into relationship with God. So I think I've got it. There's a cross-reference. I'm not going to go look it up. But uh, in Luke, there's the parable of, um, of the lost sheep. And the guy goes out, leaves the 99, finds his sheep. What happens in heaven? Who remembers? The angels, rejoice. angels are rejoicing over the one sheep that's found. And Jesus actually phrases it in the next parable. He gives a second one about, uh, I think it's about a coin being found. But he says there's more joy in heaven over a sinner who repents than 99 who don't need to. By the way, do you know 99 people who don't need to repent? No, I don't either. But so there's a lot of rejoicing going on for every one of us that's repented and come to know Christ. So that's the greater joy. And the last thing I want to leave you with in 21, as Scripture segues into this part where Jesus rejoices, it says there at that very time, he rejoiced greatly in the Holy Spirit. Now for us, if we go to Galatians 5, 22 and 23, the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy. I think I got that right. Joy is number two. Joy comes from the Spirit. Here Jesus, as the Son of God in human, as a human, but filled with the Holy Spirit, he greatly rejoices. And I think, you can check me on this, but I think this is the only time in Scripture, in the Gospels, where we're told that Jesus rejoiced or that Jesus had joy. That doesn't mean there weren't other times, but this is significant. We're told explicitly he rejoiced because 70 of his people got it. They saw God working with power and they came back rejoicing and it made him rejoice. And I think, by the way, in 21 to 24, the context tells me he's not rejoicing, although he might rejoice, for the ones that heard and believed the message through the 70. But he's specifically rejoicing before, because these 70 have come to know the Father and have seen the, the Father work. And that's why at the end of the passage, he turns to them and says, blessed of your eyes which see these things. Because so many other people before them wanted to see these things, but didn't. All right, so number one. Laborers learn to depend on God. Number two, laborers represent the Lord who sends them. And number three, laborers experience the Lord's joy. So my question to you is, are you a laborer? And by the way, I said there's a progression. Convert, disciple slash follower, then laborer. You might not be a laborer yet, but do you want to be one? What holds you back from wanting to labor for the Lord? Now, the first answer that probably comes into a bunch of people's minds is, I don't want to be sent out. I like where I live. Well, the Lord is the one, and back to verse 2, we're supposed to be praying that the Lord will send out the laborers. I think the Lord knows people's hearts. He sends them out when they're ready. But there's also other, way, other ways to labor for the Lord. And so I'm wanting you to be thinking about this. Are you laboring for the Lord? If you're a mom, you can labor for the Lord in trying to raise children who know the Lord. I actually, as you think about this, laboring from the Lord apart from just being sent out. In, in the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 5, Jesus has a, a several verses where he talks about uh, what is it to you if you do this? The Gentiles themselves do this. I think one of them is love those who love you instead of loving your enemies. If you think about it in that terms, what do I do that's different than people that don't know Christ? 
Well, if you're a mother, raising your children to teach them about Christ so that they know him is different than other moms. If you're a dad, a husband, do you love your wife as Christ loved the church? Do you nourish and cherish her? Are you providing as best you can because Christ has a hold of you and you're wanting to have your family follow the Lord? Well, that would be different than the non-believers around you, okay? But if you're not doing that, if you're providing, well, your unbelieving neighbors might be providing, okay? So I, I'm out of time. I just want to leave that with you. When you think about ways that I might labor, if it's something that all the non-believers do too, well, that's probably not laboring for the Lord. But if there's things that you do because you belong to Jesus, that would be forms of laboring for the Lord. Let me close this in a prayer. Well, we're going to sing a song and then have the question, answer, and announcements time. But I want to pray for us and also for the mission team down in Argentina because they have been sent. God has laid it on their heart to go, and we as a church have kind of commissioned them back a week ago. So let's pray for them. Father, I thank you that the six from our church went, and uh, Tim also from the other church, and that they're there with Jim. Uh, thank you for the people that, that have volunteered to be translators. And I ask, Father, that you would please help them to come back with stories of how they depended on you and saw you work with great power. And I ask, Father, as they see that, that you would fill them with joy. And as we hear about it, you would fill us with joy. And I pray also, Lord, that you would be working in us, that we would desire to be laborers in some fashion in this life that you've given us, that we would have a view of living for you, not just for ourselves. And Father, I, I also, I know that your desire is to cause us to grow from the time we have faith in you to our dying day. We're not to just coast. You want us to grow in our knowledge of you. You want us to grow in spiritual wisdom so that we, we are able to walk in a manner worthy of you, where we please you in all respects. Father, please let that be on our hearts. For any of us who, sometimes we, we know what you want in an area, but we don't want it. And so we don't even pray for that thing. Now, Father, I ask for anybody here who knows something God wants in their life, but they don't really want it, that you'd at least help them to start asking you to change their heart and thinking, that they would get to where they want what you want in their life. Thank you so much, Lord, for our group gathering today. In spite of needing to worship outside and not having a proper building we can all fit in, Lord, I lift that need up to you. When it's your timing and in the way you want, provide a better place for us. And until then, Lord, let us be willing to do things like we're doing today because we love you and our hearts are knit together in love for one another. Thank you, Father, for being with us and loving us so much. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.